I think this is probably one of the most exciting part for the people who worked uh, during the Book Dash and also those who are new here. Uh, we work with artists in every Book Dash and uh, they, as Kirsty was explaining, they, they illustrate a lot of things. You've seen that in the book and this time we also had that and I will be actually uh, showing you some of those. And folks who have contributed to developing those illustrations, just jump in and explain what you were thinking when you designed that. Um, I'll, if I remember, I'll tell you, but you don't need to like raise your hand, but just unmute and start talking. So let's start with advocacy. So folks who worked on the advocacy are not here in this call, but they were earlier in the call and uh, they say why they were designing this is to um, allow people to work in groups and recruit new people and uh, lead the movement. So advocacy doesn't just happen by one person, it has to happen in movement. There's a chapter already that exists on advocacy for uh, data science and advocacy in, in academia. The next one is about decentralized decision making um, and the decentralized decision making. This is something Kirsty and I worked on. So, Kirsty, do you want to explain this? Yeah, absolutely. So, the um, one of the things that we're very sort of keen to promote is this idea that you can um, you can sort of there's a huge power in not having a traditional hierarchy of who makes decisions. And so you can um, bring more people into being part of sort of thinking about the development of an open source project. And that means that you have to have pathways to allow people to be part of the decision making. So you have to do things transparently and, and have sort of records of, of how decisions are made. But the decentralized aspect also tries to sort of take away some of that workload because it can actually be an awful lot of uh, you know a lot of organizing effort to make those decisions to have all of those conversations and so what we were trying to illustrate here is that you can split up the the decisions that need to be made into different sort of areas so you know you might have we, we had an organizing committee for example for the book dash itself and so that was a way of um sharing some of the responsibility thinking about putting on this event designing it um with other folks and we're able to take their their advice and their learnings forward for future events and what, what we what we worked on was making making it clear that people can move between those different teams because i think the, there's a huge sort of power in saying you can be part of a, a decision making team for a little while and and then when you are busy or you're not sort of focusing on that area anymore you can step back and let someone else come in and be part of those conversations. So I think I think it's a lovely illustration to get that, get that point across. Oops. Um, so a lot of our sketches evolved. So earlier it was this. It just sounded like people are having fun and discussing, which which is probably true. But uh, with the other image, we wanted to make it more clear that this is like people collaborate with each other. Um, this one is by Esther. Yay! It's an illustration about a data management plan and, and the importance of that. So that's why the DMP is there on the map. And originally it started out as like a treasure hunting map, uh, but we decided that that might still not convey the real meaning of having a data management plan for your projects. So instead we went with a computer crash and someone who is super panicked because she lost all the data, but then she's remembering that it's not so bad because she had set up a plan and she uh, has the data somewhere backed up. So she didn't lose the data after all, but she still had a mini uh, breakdown <laughs> because the computer crashed and the data management plan saves the day. Garcia was explaining this as a parallel timeline that there is one. <laughs> that was probably a... yeah no it's I, I guess it's not super clear but um we we reasoned that whenever your computer crash the first thing that you think about is like oh no i lost everything even though like you might be fine and everything is somewhere else and you can just reinstall things etc that's true um but yeah cool so this is by uh ishmael who is 
part of research ethics committee in Turing. Um, also, we left him a cute nugget of T-Rex because uh, he calls the committee's name as T-Rex. So I'm not going to explain it because I would probably not be able to. Um, this is without T-Rex. Chris, do you want to do it? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. So, so the T-Rex is the Turing Research Ethics Committee, and so we pronounce it T-R-E-C, Rex. And that's like a fun and hilarious emoji that um, Ismail and I use when we are while sort of having all of our conversations. Um, and we are current, currently in, the, in a process of revamping the, the ethics committee that we have at the Turing to um, put in two stages. Uh, there's going to be a stage where we you get quite quick review, but then a, a sort of more formal decision making panel. And that's our kind of balance between having formal governance processes that mean we will report quarterly, et cetera, to the board but also being able to get the feedback to the reviewers as quick to the sorry to the researchers as quickly as possible so that you don't sort of end up having to wait another month for the committee to sit again and things like that so and importantly um that's what Ismail look, looks like he looks fab he's very very helpful he takes people along that journey and I'm, I'm really glad that we have a uh, an image of him to to promote So back to this one, uh, which is with Esther and Kirsty. Um, go ahead. Um, yeah, so this is an interesting one about open data because there's loads of benefits from open data, but it usually just comes down to listing all of those. Uh, and that makes my slides about open data not super convincing for people uh, to share their data, or at least uh, I don't find them uh, super attractive. Uh, so I really wanted an image on, on the benefits of uh, open data. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> originally it started out more with a spray, um, but now we, yeah, we have a, a flow of water, which is something um, you can equate open data with as a natural resource, which should be shared. Uh, some of some people have also described it as the new oil, um, but yeah, that's a little bit of a capitalistic approach to something which should be a public good uh, in my opinion so hence why there's a fountain of uh, open data and there's a, another version of this which is more uh, about the individual benefits of open data uh, so here someone wants to reuse some data uh, so that they don't have to gather it themselves so that's the benefit of the the bird on the left and then the right bird is like oh yes, you can reuse this and we can work together on it. So this bird is getting some collaboration and, and some, uh, yeah, recognition for their work and, and getting more stuff done, so. And this is the, the first version that evolved ah, yeah, to be. The... Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, this is something that um, Batul already showed, and I think we have another version of that, which is the final one. Batul, you wanna take it? Uh, I already explained it when I was uh, yeah, yeah explaining the book, but it's just basically this is the octopus from the GitHub icon itself. It's listening to the event, which is BR created, issue created, or any kind of event, then that's gonna trigger the action, which is test deployment or any kind of yeah action. So that's pretty much it. Thank you. Um, this is from, let me see if there's a, yeah, the, this is a goat herding that we have in the lab with Kirsty, where every week someone uh, is the goat herder and they get to decide what kind of topics they wanna share in the lab and make sure that everyone's um, engaging with each other and is, um, yeah, just to support each other. So I like that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a sorry to interrupt. I'm gonna put a link in the in the chat for it. It comes from a Terry Pratchett quote who talks about the fact that um, sheep are stupid and need to be need to be herded, and um, goats are clever and need to be led. And so instead of a shepherd, we went with a goat herder, and um, it's been a delight ever since we we put that in place. Sorry, carry on. Uh, this one is on hidden labor uh, that I have, I think, a lot about uh, where how we can make sure that we can move away from a single star who gets the stage 
uh, to all the people who are behind the scene, um, whose work are generally hidden, get the recognition, reward, visibility, and opportunity. Um, and I really love it. This one is by Kirsty as well. Yeah, so, so this was um, some of the th thinking that I was doing around the structure of the collaboration book. And I was thinking about uh, the different types of collaboration and what sort of questions we could ask readers to think about what their needs were for their collaboration so that they could customize um, the design to, to best fit their, their needs. So we, we have this, this question around, do you want open or inner source? So do you want to work kind of in the garden where everyone can see what you're doing and potentially come along? Or do you want to sort of work primarily inside of a team that you already have? So that's sort of represented in the house. Um, do you want new members? Do you want to be inviting new members in? Or do you, do you have kind of already predefined who's going to be working on the project? Um, the what task and why is thinking about the fact that there's a big thing called a collaboration, which is a large community of people or a team of people working together. But actually individual collaborations sit inside of that. So you might sort of jump on a Zoom call to talk through something or you might send an email to like 50 different people and thinking about um, the purpose of that type of interaction is really important because that will help you to understand if you want synchronous or asynchronous um, communication. So we've got the notice board there to indicate asynchronous and we've got some folks chatting and working together for that synchronous element. And then we've also got this question of, you know, now that you've decided on synchronous or asynchronous, if you want synchronous, does it have to be in person? Would it be best to be remote or is a better purpose to have a hybrid of the two? So I love this. I think um, it was amazing to me that she was able to take my general ramblings about how do you get people together to talk about their needs um, into this, this house with their, with their garden. And, uh... There would be this would be like an overview chapter for collaboration, right? Wonderful. We do have lots of chapters in collaboration guide, and it's really hard to follow a structure. So I'm really glad that this is going to happen. Uh, this is also Wicker C. So this one comes from I'm I'm very passionate about the Jupiter community. I'm I'm very keen to support the work of the Jupiter community. Um, but Jupiter notebooks are sort of well, they, they can be um, disliked by many because they often, there are sort of challenges around them. And what we were trying to do with this illustration is talk about the fact that Jupyter Notebooks are really, really good for when you're figuring things out and you're just trying to sort of interact with, um, write down some words, type in the commands, see what, see, what, see what those commands do. But actually at some point in your project, you want to get to a point where your Jupyter Notebook is very, very like, trim, that it's very tidy, that it's got a decent amount of text, but the, the code itself should ideally be moved out into version controlled scripts or in a library that would not be in the format of a Jupyter notebook file. And then once you've completed your work and you've got that nice and tidy and it's all working well, you actually might want to then create something that looks like a tutorial where you then break out the different lines in your in your analysis and explain to people what they do. Um, and so you can use these different Jupyter notebooks kind of at different stages and for different purposes through your analysis lifecycle. Yeah, this is uh, this is a mountain of engagement that I talk a lot about whenever someone says, oh, I'm a new community manager and I don't know where to start. Uh, because Mountain of Engagement allows you to think about various places that people come and interact with you and what kind of role they can play. So you can see that, um, you know, there, there are people who might have a lot of questions like, you know, where can I find information? What, how can I contribute? Um, what opportunities are there for you? And all these information are often quite unwritten. And one of the things that I have is that I want to like, make everything very explicit so people have ways to understand each other and mountain of engagement allows you to document all these processes and share with people and make it a healthy community so i think these ones are given by two of um two students who are working on mountain of engagement and they are dividing the community based on are they 
people who are just coming and seeing what's happening. Uh, for example, they learn about something from a newsletter or, or Twitter, for example, are these people who are meeting and attending uh, calls like this, for example. And then finally, if they really like what we're doing, they can come and work with us. But there is like furthermore, this is probably just a part of a bigger, bigger mountain. So you can imagine how far this can go. Uh, this is from a discussion that Emma was leading a few days ago where we were talking about um, communication, but also we touched upon open research and closed research. And this basically shows that there is no good or bad. There are reasons for people to do something one way or other. And you can have a very civil <laughs> argument about and tell your own side of story why you're, uh, why you're doing open research and why someone has an efficiency against it. This is the older version where we didn't agree that efficiency is a good argument because I think efficiency could be from open science as well. Uh, this is a project lifecycle image, which was designed by Chris Burr, and uh, it, it basically divides the research lifecycle into different phases where you can start by project design and you can have like a, a different teams working on it and making sure that there are deliberation then you can move to the model development and uh, followed by upskilling and deployment and have this uh, named whatever you want. So everybody in, in the book dash thought that this can be you know, named differently for different purposes. So one thing that we will actually do is to share a version of each image without the text. So people can adapt it in their language or uh, whatever they want to speak with it. This is the drawing uh, that Kirsty and Mariana did together. Mariana, do you want to explain this? I think you showed the chapter and it makes sense, but I'll give you the mic anyway. <laughs> so the image is pretty straightforward. I wanted an image for the chapter because I base I, I base what I did more on the image of the cycle that already existed, but then of course, that's not the information that is in the chapter. So I made an image and I wanted to convey the idea that the first step is maybe the bigger one. And then you, the, the steps are really small and that you don't have to do it alone. So, yeah. This is a wonderful, I really love it. Uh, this is the project roadmap that a group of uh, graduate students, uh, no, actually Lottie was working on this one where uh, she wanted to describe how roadmaps look like that you can set different milestone, but also over a period of time, it's possible that, uh, you know, there is one road that you thought is good, but at some point you have to recalculate and change the route. So just exactly like in Google map, for example, uh, that you can take different various routes to uh, meet your milestone and that's your roadmap. This is about barriers in, in any context. That's why we did not use any uh, labels on it because it's very self-explanatory that often people take different routes and they face different barriers. And uh, from each other's perspective, uh, we might not fully understand, but uh, we already know about these kind of challenges. This is from uh, Aida. She is a research application manager, hence the RAM. And uh, she told a really nice story and I don't think I can uh, duplicate that. Uh, so I would, uh, I would ask you to come back and watch the YouTube video where I would add her <laughs> explanation. Uh, this is a version of structuring your repository in, uh, uh, for example, when preparing for project. And this is also designed by a group of uh, graduate students who are working on making sure that people working on different sort of projects know how to organize their files in a way that they are findable at any stages um, of their research. This is another fun version of it because we felt that this is quite simple and it's sort of like everybody thinks that they know what structuring looks like. But uh, what we wanted to convey is that uh, when you have lots of files which are not organized, it can get really stressful every time you have to deal with it. Whereas of course, when you know how to do it good, you can go on holiday and do something else with that time. Uh, we have on reusable codes, uh, which is about code quality and code review that you can have lots of codes which are, if not maintained, can be 
quite tricky to understand. Whereas if there are maintainers who put thoughts into um, about their user or thinking about themselves as the future user, they would take care of their code. And um, there's a chapter that's being written by Carlos who designed this one. This is by Nina, uh, who is working on self-reflective uh, guidance for ethics, uh, which is a way of learning. So she, her intention was that for people who in their graduate school, for example, haven't gone through self-reflection kind of course, uh, this could be useful. So she wanted to convey that people can think about, you know, what, what different sort of people or different communities face, for example, depending on their gender or race or age. And uh, again, I think it's a wonderful work by Sophie who thought that this will make lots of sense. And I think it does that you wear different glasses and see from people's lens. This is on unionization uh, where, well, we, it, it is in our ethics guide. It's a, a lot of open research intersection and working condition. And there's a chapter on this one. Another one on unionization designed by Laura Carter, where um, she was describing how unionization can be done in a different level. You can become a member, you can join meetings, but you can also go on to represent people. Um, there are different gradients of engagement. This is on whistleblowing, um, quite self-explanatory, uh, so I wouldn't even explain. Here we have an authority. In this case, we thought anybody should be able to listen to whistleblower ever as uh, this one is for if you want to call the police. This is on communication with wider audience. I think Emma was working on this. There are multiple versions of that, but as you've heard already, Marta and Maria talking about the chapter that they were writing, this would probably make a lot of sense. That's a lot about accessibility. You can summarize blogs, social media, podcasts, lay summary, and also have translation. And this is a different version of it where you can also have uh, communication in a very access inaccessible and technical manner, which doesn't make it uh, more widely accessible. Yeah, just different <laughs> hairstyle in hijab. Okay, that was it. Uh, we, I think we worked on quite a lot of sketches and uh, that took us like 20 minutes <laughs> to get through. Wonderful job, everybody. And wonderful job to, of course, our artists.